In the mid-90s, there was a cluster of albums which, after the long, dark, wearying years of the last over-bloated 80s super acts and the fudding tedium of grunge, truly resonated with me. Brilliant pop records like the debuts from Fountain of Wayne, or Ben Folds 5, or the wicked fun of Beck's Odelay, Brit pop records like Different Class by Pulp, or Dogman Star by Suede, or old school records with a haunting vibe like Jeff Buckley's Grace, and most powerfully and most unlikely, Scott Walker's madly majestic tilt. Genius is not a word I bandy freely, generally reserving it for a handful of pivotal figures. One of those, the slow-building and late-blooming genius, is Scott Walker, who took lessons he adapted from pop, tore out the Americanized core and replaced it with European song mores, and his own willful vision to create music which was beautiful, disturbing, and occasionally impenetrable. Such is his dark masterpiece. Tilt. A little background. Scott Walker began life as Noel Engel, born about 20 miles north of Cincinnati. His family moved to California when he was 16, where he became somewhat of a beatnik. He was so gifted a bass player that he was playing Los Angeles session work as a teenager. He even released a few singles in an attempt to become a teen idol. In 1964, Engel, John Walker, and Gary Leeds headed to England where they morphed into the Walker Brothers and Noel Engel became Scott Walker. The Walker Brothers had two number one hit singles in England, sharing producers and arrangers with no less than Dusty Springfield, and after they broke up, Scott had a run of four remarkable albums, Scott, Scott 2, Scott 3, Scott 4, Scott 2 making number one, each featuring knotty art pop songs and increasingly Walker's idiosyncratic compositions, but time and tastes changed, and Walker drifted into one-time pop star complacency until reduced circumstances saw him required to reform the Walker Brothers for a couple of hits in the mid-70s and three albums, the final of which the band produced themselves and contained Scott's remarkable compositions, The Electrician, about the work of a CIA torturer, the title track, which was covered by David Bowie on Black Tie White Noise, and Fat Mama Kick, a tribute to an anti-Marxist writer, Bernard Henri Lede, clear stepping stones to the musical and thematic direction he was later to develop. This began, or reignited, I should say, a reciprocal cycle of influence between Walker and his longtime admirer, David Bowie. Night Flights, having been influenced by Heroes, Lodger by Night Flights, Hours in particular by Night Flights in 1984's Climate of Hunter, and Parts of the Next Day and Black Star by vast swathes of Walker's unique work of songs that are unmistakably pop songs, but filtered through a progressively distorted lens full of grotesquerie and allure. In 1995, Tilt arrived and irrevocably changed the game. Tilt is an album of dizzying ambition, of vertiginous plunges and violent upthrusts. It is tainted by blood, not vital red blood. This is a black blood that courses slow and poisons its bearer. Tilt is night and fog. It is an opera that haunts Walker, and equally one that Walker himself haunts. It is a record built on ghosts and the fantastic strength of Walker's musical vision. It is dark, isolating, a mirror to all our well-shielded madness. It is, on reflection, the perfect soundtrack for those darkest days of COVID. I've read numerous reviews of Tilt that, while praising it, consign it to some impenetrable, unlistenable, and compelling music concrete. I vehemently disagree with most of this. Tilt is an album of songs and stories. There are melodies, there is observable regular structure, and there are even hooks. It must be said the music always leads 
further into darkness and the lyrics progressively disassociate themselves from our reality and descend more into the circus hall of mirrors that is Walker's imagination. The album opens with a long dark pad which leads us to the most normal song on the album, the beautifully string buoyed farmer in the city. Normal in as much as a song about the murder of an Italian poet and filmmaker Paolo Pasolini killed when a teenage prostitute he hired ran over him with his own car 21 times can possibly be. Walker's voice high in the mix is no longer the smooth crooning baritone he had minced in the 60s but is now a high quivering buttery tenor moving between a sonorous drone and a yelp of pain with the dreamy music which ends with a dramatic cesura. Farmer in the City is a broken bird of song heavenly strings, scarifying howls, and a man seemingly going knowingly to his doom. The cockfighter emerges from disembodied moans into madness. The comparison with mid-90s and Finder sequel Bowie is inevitable, as it blends ambient bass tones, mad floating voices, alternatively whispering and screaming synth pads, and driving drum and bass percussion to tell the story of a concentration camp guard or perhaps it's a train driver who brings the victims to the camp, through the metaphor of a cockfight complete with transcripts from Adolf Eichmann's trial and a relentless rush to a puff of steam or smoke and like the previous song. Remarkably, Tilt was recorded without sampling, click tracks or guide vocals. Particularly for slow measured pieces like those on Tilt, Musicians generally hate to play without these. Bouncer, See Bouncer, the longest, slowest song on the album, must have been a particular challenge, being there's only a bass drum, some rattling bells, and various disembodied howls and sweeps. Walker's lyrics have descended into, in this case, an impenetrable psychobabble, but his voice is glorious here. Modern pop music pays little attention to lyrics, seeing them largely as rhythmic devices, more than communication tools. Similarly, Walker, grounded in chanson and European singing styles, uses his lyrics as focus points for vocal drama and pathos, the narrative being secondary. By Bouncer Say Bouncer, though, you are completely immersed in the crepuscular world of tilt, gazing upwards from its dark chamber, hoping to glance some ray of sunlight through the oubelette that you assume lies at the top. Apart from the repeated don't play that song for me motif. You have no idea where you are. What your mad cellmate is routing about. And you get the chilling feeling that you're acclimatizing. And somehow, even if you survive this, you will never be the same again. And then, just as Bouncer Say Bouncer glides away and the Stockholm Syndrome begins to set in, we have Manhattan. In the late 1960s, when Walker was having number one albums, there was a TV show that ran for a couple of seasons called The Prisoner. For those who haven't seen it, the final episode is just about the maddest thing ever put on TV. The prisoner is free and goes back to the real world, only to find it indistinguishable from his prison. The custodians of the real world, indistinguishable from his jailer, and some guys in gorilla suits that I never really understood. Manhattan is that moment where heaven and hell are indistinguishable. Humanity and inhumanity are not two faces of the same coin, but the same face of the same coin. God and Caesar are the same, and they both ask the same thing. Musically, Manhattan is brilliant. The blaring, overlong synth washes both parody Broadway horns but acts as a tonal ground. They don't change the key when Walker's vocal kicks in or follow the melody line. They simply blaze as Walker bends his voice into harmony and dissonance with them. The bass playing is incredible. John Giblin is a master and certainly has come a long way since playing on Babushka by Kate Bush 40 years ago. And the percussive effects contribute tremendously. If I have a favourite song on the album, it would be Face on Breast, with its droning synths, probing bass from Giblin, insistent percussion, and Walker's tender voice. Well, as tender as things get in tilt. With as close to the record comes as a straightforward love song. Except it isn't straightforward. It's a soul in hell proposing kinky sex to an angel on a precipice, or an 
angel in hell and the soul on the precipice. Bolivia 95 is a moody, purposeful piece, evoking the death, blood, misplaced idealism and lemon-bloody cola against the closest thing the album has to a groove. It's also the point where Walker comes closest to touching on a reciprocal round of influence between himself and David Bowie, the song being redolent of some of the material on side two of Scary Monsters. But the song breaks into movements, the most shocking of which features just Walker's voice, giblin' space and some minimal percussion. It cannot be stated just how otherworldly and unique Walker's voice is here, and it's here and on the title track that that voice is at its most heightened. The 8 minute plus Patriot is a superbly immersive piece of music, mixing giblin, shrieking synths, cloud-like strings and Walker's quivering mock operatic voice. The good news you cannot refuse, the bad news is there is no news, intones Walker across a sweeping multi-part meditation on capitalism and violence. The title track is ostensibly the most conventional thing on the album, a haunted hoedown meditating on what is lost and can never be truthfully reimagined. David Rhodes plays some harrowing guitar pieces here, and Walker's reverb-drenched voice summons the requisite phantoms. But like all of Tilt, it's the use of space and shadow, and the points at which Walker has it intrude, that makes it fascinating and gets it inside your head. The album ends with the brief, delicate rosary, which comes closest to summoning back the voice of Scott Walker from the 1960s. Impenetrably poetic, yet somehow you feel hope in it. The only ray of hope, of redemption, of recovery from loss in its atmosphere. It seems as fair a point as any to depart what is less an album, less a suite of songs, and more like a journey down a dark, deep, slow-flowing river into night and fog. Tilt is one of the dominant records of the 1990s and for me one of the dominant records in my listening experience. I found it tremendously hard going at first but after many listenings late at night and finally the experience of not trying to listen to it just take the pure chance that letting it inhabit you changed not only my experience of the music as a whole but in some way fundamentally shifted my perception of all music. I'm not going to say that Tilt is a record that everyone who is serious about music should own. It isn't. And someone who resists its darkly oleaginous charms isn't less a connoisseur for it. I'll just say it's an album I needed to own and one that new listeners or resistors can assess on their own experience of it. That's not to say, of course, that I don't strongly recommend you do so.